Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Togoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about the cardiac muscle action potential. But before we do that, I want to do a very brief review of some of the things we've talked about up to this point. We're going to be integrating a lot of things, and it's helpful to know what things piece together and how. So first, remember that cardiac conduction system. In fact, you can even see this is arranged in the shape of the heart. Down here you have the apex uh, at the bottom where the left ventricle meets the right ventricle. Up here is the, the right atrium. And remember that in normal healthy individuals, up here at number one, those depolarizations are initiated by the normal pacemaker of the heart, the SA node or sinoatrial node. And you can see how those action potentials are going to spread to different regions of the heart. Again, we talked about that, so if you need more detail, go back and watch that video. But we'll actually reference this slide later on in the video. And for these cells of the heart that are generating action potentials, they have a pacemaker potential. Okay? So think about it. The sinoatrial node would be the normal pacemaker of the heart, so it would have a pacemaker potential. And again, we talked about this in the previous video. And remember that those pacemaker cells, that electrical conduction system of the heart, is spreading those action potentials all throughout the muscle of the heart in different areas. So what does that mean? Well, remember, when the sinoatrial node depolarizes, that's going to spread action potentials uh, to the cardiomyocytes, so those are muscle cells, in this area. So that would be in the right atrium. One route for those action potentials is to go to Bachmann's bundle. That's for the left atrium. And so when action potentials get to Bachmann's bundle, then the cardiomyocytes of the left atrium contract. And then when the action potential spreads down here into the ventricles, for example right here, when action potentials get here, this area of the right ventricle contracts. It'll eventually come around here. Then when they get over here to this 5A region, then this region of the right ventricle contracts, and so on and so forth. So basically, the thing to remember is the area where the action potentials are in this electrical conduction system is going to correspond with the area of the heart muscle that's contracting. And so that's the reason why the atria contract before the ventricles. It's because the action potentials are originally just up here. Okay, and so that means that the atria are going to contract first. Once the action potentials spread across the His bundle, down through the bundle branches, and into the Purkinje fibers, then the ventricles will contract. And so it's important to remember atria contract before the ventricles, but that's because of the nature of the spread of that action potential. Now, one very important point going forward that I want to make clear is that when a certain region of the electrical conduction system is depolarizing, then only certain cardiomyocytes are going to have action potentials and are going to be contracting. Okay? So for example, we have this region of the electrical conduction system right here. Okay? So only these cardiomyocytes will be contracting, and we're going to talk about how that works in this video. Up here, when this region of the electrical conduction system is depolarizing, only these cardiomyocytes up here will have action potentials. So what does that mean on a big scale? So for example, look at the sinoatrial node. When the sinoatrial node is depolarizing, only cardiomyocytes in this vicinity around the, that would be the right atrium, are going to be contracting. When you just have action potentials in the SA node, is the left ventricle going to be contracting? No, because these cardiomyocytes are very far from the SA node. Likewise, when the action potentials reach Bachmann's bundle, that's going to correspond with cardiomyocytes in the left atrium that are going to be contracting. But again, if they're in Bachmann's bundle, that is the action potentials, the right ventricle is not going to be contracting, right? And that also leads to one other point. The atria always contract before the ventricles. Why is that? Well, if the SA node is the pacemaker of the heart, it's going to initiate those depolarizations. Well, the depolarizations are initially just going to be confined up here on the right atrium side and over here in Bachmann's bundle on the left atrium side. And so initially the atria will contract, but then once those depolarizations spread down through the His bundle after the AV delay and you get into the bundle branches and Purkinje fibers, then the ventricles contract. And that's very important 
The atria contract before the ventricles because the atria receive those depolarizations and subsequent action potentials before they get to the ventricles. And if everything contracted at the same time, blood wouldn't move. In fact, because the ventricles are stronger, blood may actually move backwards. So it's important that the atria contract before the ventricles. That leads us back here. We've seen the structure of the electrical conductive system. We've seen now how those cells spread the depolarizations of the action potentials throughout the conductive system. But let's see now what they do with that to the cardiomyocytes. And remember, cardiomyocytes are the single functional units of cardiac muscle. These are the contractile cells. So let's suppose we're looking at this region of the electrical conductive system. These would be the cardiomyocytes in that vicinity, right? So this electrical cell is going to spread an action potential into this cardiomyocyte. Now these cardiomyocytes are connected to each other via these little black boxes, which are meant to be gap junctions. Okay? So when we look at the spread of an action potential from cardiomyocyte to cardiomyocyte, it actually occurs through ion flow through this structure called a gap junction. So before we get into this, think back to skeletal muscle. Remember to depolarize the skeletal muscle cell, we had to have sodium influx into that cell. Well, imagine if those ions influx into this cardiomyocyte. Well, you don't have to have a separate influx into the next cardiomyocyte. Rather, the, the ions that come into this cardiomyocyte will simply move through this gap junction into the next cell, and through the gap junction into this next cell, and through the gap junction into this next cell. And so this leads to a much more rapid uh, activation of subsequent cardiomyocytes, and that's why the, the heart is able to contract as quickly as it does. Let's take a look at that structure right here. So you can see right here two cardiomyocytes. Okay? They're in very close proximity, but you can see here that they're separated by this protein complex called a gap junction. Okay? A gap junction, as we said, allows ion flow from one cardiomyocyte into the next. So as we'll see, when this cardiomyocyte right here on the left uh, undergoes all its chemical events and contracts, the ions from there simply move to the next cardiomyocyte through that gap junction, and you get the same thing repeating there. And then just those ions will move from cell to cell to cell. Okay, And that's all initiated by a cell of the electrical conduction system. And now that leads us into talking about the biochemical events that are taking place within the cardiomyocyte during the action potential of the heart. So just to orient with this picture, this big square right here, this is of course an individual cardiomyocyte. Down here we have the actin-myosin complex, of course with troponin, tropomyosin. Here's the sarcoplasmic reticulum, very similar to what we saw in skeletal muscle. It's loaded at rest with calcium ions. Up here we have a potassium channel, a calcium channel, and a sodium channel. And then over here on the left we have a gap junction. Now, this is a true gap junction if it connects two cardiomyocytes. So for example, um, we have this cardiomyocyte. If the cell before this on the left was also a cardiomyocyte, this would be a gap junction. However, this could also correspond uh, really to just simply the electrical conductive system activating the first cardiomyocyte in the series. So that means that if this were the cardiomyocyte in question, the first one in the sequence, then this right here would just represent the electrical conductive system initially depolarizing that first cardiomyocyte. So let's suppose that the cell on the left here was another cardiomyocyte. So we're looking at this situation. Here's the cell in question, the previous cell is a cardiomyocyte. And we mentioned that there's going to be ion influx from the previous cardiomyocyte to the one in question. And that's going to actually lead to activation of that cardiomyocyte. So right here we see that gap junction. We see an electrical current spreading through that gap junction from the initial cardiomyocyte to this one. And now you see ion influx in here. Now initially at rest before this current comes into this cardiomyocyte, this cardiomyocyte has a resting membrane potential at negative 90 millivolts. It's even more negative than we see with skeletal muscle. But as soon as this positive current comes in, you have these positive ions in here, that membrane potential is going to elevate from negative 90 millivolts to about negative 70. So that's your second step. Now, this sodium channel right here, 
won't open until the membrane potential is negative 70. So that's pretty handy because now that we have these positive ions in here and they've raised the membrane potential of negative 70, that allows this sodium channel to open. And it's going to allow some sodium ions in, as you see right here. Okay? Now, that's a rapid depolarization because in a very, very short amount of time, it's going to raise the membrane potential from negative 70 to positive 30 millivolts. Well, just like this sodium channel wouldn't open until the membrane potential is negative 70, this calcium channel right here won't open until the membrane potential is about positive 30. Well, our membrane potential is now positive 30, so this calcium channel will now open. Now, I don't want the focus of this video to be the action potential diagram for the cardiomyocyte, but I do want to interject and show you a couple things. Number one, notice here uh, from roughly rest, we have this rapid depolarization due to the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels, and it brings the membrane potential from a very negative value to a fairly positive value okay, in orange. That corresponds with this right here. We open the voltage-gated sodium channel, now we have positive ion influx that causes the membrane potential to go from about negative 70 to positive 30. The second thing I want you to notice here is right when we get to the peak here, there's really two channels that really open around the same time. One is a potassium channel and the other is a calcium channel. Okay? So potassium channels open and that allows potassium to efflux. It actually moves out of the cell. So if potassium, a positively charged ion, is moving out of the cell, that will make the cell more negative. And those potassium channels really stay open. Okay? But you'll notice here that we have this plateau in the membrane potential. Okay. That's due to the opening of what are called L-type voltage-gated calcium channels. From now on, I'll just call them voltage-gated calcium channels. Calcium is a positively charged ion, and so when these calcium channels open, calcium moves in. So the reason that there's a plateau here and there's no appreciable change in membrane potential is that as you have a positive ion moving out, that is potassium, you also have a positive ion moving in. And so if you have positive moving in, positive moving out, you're going to have a balanced membrane potential and therefore a plateau. So I just want to mention that so you understand that. Okay, so now we're on to step five. I mentioned that that voltage-gated potassium channel and L-type voltage-gated calcium channel, they both open around the same time. It should be noted that the potassium channel is a little faster. Okay, so initially we're going to see potassium efflux. Okay? So a positive charge is moving out of the cell. That would normally make the inside of the cell more negative, and it technically does make it a little more negative, but very quickly after that, these calcium ions start to come in, because remember, that voltage-gated calcium channel opens. So we have a balance of the membrane potential due to movement of positive out and movement of positive in. It's kind of like if you have a classroom with 30 students. If for every five students that leave, five more students come in, you always have 30 students, right? If 10 students come in and 10 students leave, you still have 30 students, right? So it's balanced. And so that leads to what's called the plateau. And that's what you see here in the action potential diagram. It's a plateau of the membrane potential. But the reason why we have a plateau in cardiac muscle is because we absolutely have to let the atria finish contracting before the ventricles, okay? If the atria contract too quickly, then the atria are not going to be able to eject all their blood into the ventricles, and then our stroke volume is going to be affected, our cardiac output, and overall efficiency. So we have to have this plateau. But at the end of the plateau, our membrane potential is going to be about positive 30. It could be a little less depending on the source that you're looking at. The exact nature of the numbers is not important. The important thing to understand is we have a plateau and why. Now, Potassium efflux and calcium influx. So we've got now more calcium inside the cell. Well, that's pretty handy because of step seven. Remember that the sarcoplasmic reticulum contains a lot of calcium. It turns out that the calcium that comes in through this voltage-gated calcium channel, which triggers the plateau, has a second function. It's able to come over here to the SR and activate a calcium channel that causes release of more calcium. So look at that. The calcium that came in here binds to receptors here on the SR membrane, and it triggers the release of more calcium. 
This step number eight right here is what's called calcium induced calcium release. Why is it called that? Because calcium that came in here from the plateau is stimulating more calcium release from the SR. And this calcium right here can then go and initiate muscle contraction at the troponin tropomyosin complex, which we won't get into in too much detail here, but it functions very similarly to what we see in skeletal muscle. And all these steps that I've just talked about, part of five all the way through step nine, this is all happening during the plateau phase, okay? And that makes sense because during the plateau phase, the muscle is going to be contracting. So we have to have this calcium induced calcium release where this new calcium from the SR can then go to the troponin tropomyosin complex and induce actin myosin cross bridge cycling. That gives us muscle contraction. But if we have a way to contract, we have to have a way to relax. So that's going to lead us into that repolarization phase, which we're going to pick up with here right now. Now again, in this diagram, you can see once that plateau is complete, we're actually going to get closure of those voltage-gated calcium channels. Okay? But notice that potassium channel remains open until the very end. So that plateau, remember, was due to the balance of potassium going out and calcium coming in. Well, if the calcium flow stops because those channels close, you still have potassium effluxing, and that means a positive charge moving out of the cell, so that cell is going to become more negative, and that's going to induce the repolarization, which allows the cardiomyocyte to relax. Okay? So during repolarization, there's a couple of things that happen. Number one, uh, the calcium voltage-gated channels are going to close. So notice here, this channel has closed, and since there's no more calcium coming in, uh, this channel over here on the SR is no longer active either. So you don't have calcium coming into the cell from the outside, and you don't have calcium coming into the cytoplasm from the SR. Okay? Another thing that happens is the calcium has to be removed. Okay? Think about it. Calcium is what's responsible for uh, causing cross-bridge cycling. And so as long as calcium is still here, Right, bound to troponin, you're going to remain in a contracted state, and that would be tetany, and heart muscle cannot have that. So we have to have a way to get rid of calcium. And this is done through three mechanisms. The first is an active transport pump that moves calcium out of the cell. So calcium can be moved out of the cell here. Um, you can also have a calcium pump that moves calcium from the cytoplasm into the SR. And then there's also a protein right here called calcequestrin. Calcequestrin is a calcium binding protein that simply binds calcium and moves it into the SR independent of the pump. So the idea is get calcium out of the cytoplasm. Why do you have to do that? Because if calcium remained in the cytoplasm, some of it would remain bound to troponin, and that would cause the heart muscle to remain in a contracted state, which would kill you because the heart would stop pumping blood. It's almost as if the heart would be in an isometric contraction which as we know is physi physiologically impossible. The other thing that'll happen here, um, not in this order necessarily, is those potassium channels remain open, right? And so you have continued potassium efflux, which leads to repolarization, right? If you're moving positive charges out of the cell, it's gonna bring you back down closer to your resting membrane potential, which in the case of the cardiac muscle is about negative 90. All right. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the context of cardiac muscle contraction and also the events that are going on within the cell. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.